Hello, Catherine. Welcome to the Make Life Rich Movement podcast. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. I'm so happy to be here. Everyone, we are in for quite a treat today, especially if you consider yourself a perfectionist or perfectionist adjacent. Uh, we are speaking with Catherine Morgan Schaeffler. She is a psychotherapist, former uh, on-site therapist to Google, but most importantly, she is the author of a book I know you're going to come to keep on your desk for many moons because it is going to be so influential to not only your business, but to your life. And it is called The Perfectionist's Guide to Losing Control. Catherine, please tell me a little bit about what brought you to the topic of perfectionism. As a psychotherapist, I'm sure you have a very wide range of what you've tended to deal with in the past, but I, I would love to know where the topic of perfectionism came to become a, a point of focus for you. Yes. So I've worked in a lot of clinical contexts. Like you said, I worked on site at Google. I worked in a rehab. I had a private practice off Wall Street. I worked with young kids who were severely traumatized um, in residential treatment care. And perfectionism exists in all these spaces. And I started noticing patterns between the people that I was working with and patterns within myself that were not explained by this really <clears throat> narrow definition of perfectionism that we use in mainstream culture. And so I looked to the research and there's a big, huge chasm between the way the research world talks about perfectionism and the way that commercial wellness talks about it. And I thought, that's interesting. Why is that happening? Mm -hmm. um, the research world identifies adaptive and maladaptive perfectionists. So healthy versions of perfectionists and unhealthy versions. And they're beginning to ask the question, researchers, what makes some perfectionists so joyful and so connected to meaning and what is causing other perfectionists to really suffer in ways that are painful at best and, you know, dangerous, um, at worst, you know, there's, there's all kinds of landmines connected to perfectionism. So I took all of that information and just tried to really put my own language to this construct of perfectionism and this identity of perfectionist and write what I have found to be true about it in the many years and thousands of hours of listening to perfectionists um, talk to me about their lives in the most honest way. And the book is really like a way for me to attempt to contain some of that, um, the core themes of healing, what helps people really recover, what the difference is between things like um, attachment and connection mm -hmm. or like instant gratification and pleasure. These like very nuanced kinds of learning that I needed to remember for myself. <laughs> they say that you write the books you most need yourself. And so I think that was a big part of it too. Wow. It is a very beautiful um, amalgamation of what I would, I could only imagine is the intimacy of all of the knowledge you've collected from all of these um, different cases and people that you've worked with, because it was really, um, just so everyone's aware, the um, cases, quote unquote, cases listed in the book are, are anecdotally rendered. So this is not exposing anyone's like life or their journey or what they're going through with their... Um, their particular portions of growth, but it was still so um, intimate of an accounting that you could imagine any number of people that you knew or yourself within the the people and, and you explaining kind of what they were working on or where their particular, um, you know, struggles were at the moment for how they were dealing with perfectionism. And I found it just really... Um, adjacent to comforting it was just very it felt very familiar and it felt like you understood so deeply the feelings attached to what are i'm guessing uh clinical definitions of what perfectionism has been known to be but it really felt like you ripped 
you rip the bandaid off or you open the lid off and you really let it out to breathe so that it could be something that, you know, a normal person like me could, could take in and understand and really make some concrete changes and a lot of aha moments. It's, it was just beautifully done in a way that was also very informational. I learned a lot, but I felt a lot also. And mm. that is sometimes hard to, to, um, for me at least to have happened in the same book. So, um, Thank you. Yeah, I think isn't storytelling so powerful? I mean, I really connect with lessons when they're encased in a story. Um, And otherwise, it's just like an encyclopedia of information. You know, it's kind of this one dimensional like advice given to you that doesn't really land. I mean, Perhaps it does for some people, but it, it doesn't for me. Um, and sometimes it doesn't matter how many stories we hear about someone else struggling with something. We have to learn ourselves. Mm. Like the, there are certain lessons that just need to be learned experientially. Um, but other lessons we can learn through the stories of other people who have gone through them. And when we see other people's stories, we can kind of create a bigger composite of, Mm -hmm. well, my story is kind of like that in this way and and Mm -hmm. create a sense of connection that in itself is curative. Mm -hmm. So my intention with the book wasn't like, I want the reader to close this book with as much information and facts as possible. Like that's, that's great if that happens. But I really just wanted there to be what you were just describing, which is, can a person connect to this? Because if you can, if you can get connection in the mix, the, everything else kind of self-corrects around that. People know what they need and actually only they know what they need. We're just disconnected to ourselves and disconnected to as a sort of deeper, intuitive, intelligent knowing that we, we can't always steer ourselves in that path. Sometimes we're just connected to the confidence that even if we know what we need to do, that, that we could actually do it. And so to me, I was like, if I can just write a book that connects, like the reader can figure everything else out, you know? It's a, it's a very like come hither. It, it, you, you achieved exactly what you were doing. To, oh, I like that. Going Come for. hither. It, I really heard that it. before. It, it beckoned me to think, apply, and keep going. Because it was already like, oh, okay, that's when I do this. Oh, oh, yes, yes. Okay, that makes sense. Oh, wow, I didn't know that, like, not everyone's a perfectionist. That fact blew my mind. Hmm. And I guess also alluded me to understanding that I may be on the perfectionism spectrum. But could you... I guess, define what the overall category of perfectionism is. Sure. Um, and then can we discuss the different types? Because this really just, I was blown away. I had no idea there were different types. Yeah. So there's no clinical definition for perfectionist. Perfectionism is not a disorder um, in the DSM, which is the big book of mental health disorders. Um, <clears throat> and so some of the confusion about what this is comes from the fact that academics and researchers and therapists and and just, you know, everyday people are grafting their own definitions on to what it means to be a perfectionist. And to me, I think about perfectionism in the same way I think about romanticism or activism or being an artist. It's like an, a deep identity marker. Um, I notice that people don't talk about being a perfectionist episodically, meaning like they're not like, oh my God, you should have seen me last Wednesday. I was being such a perfectionist. They say <laughs> things like, I'm a perfectionist. So of course, da, 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 you know, and, and when you take in an identity in that way, it's not helpful to say to that person who has integrated that identity into who they are, it's not helpful to tell them to stop doing that. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like telling a romantic to stop believing in love so much or telling an activist to stop caring so much and and let go of that active impulse they feel to, to do something about it. It doesn't work. And that's what all the books that I saw about perfectionism were doing. 
Um, and so I define a perfectionist as someone who sees the reality and sees an ideal and feels more often than not an active compulsion to bridge that gap. Now, healthy perfectionists understand that ideals are meant to um, inspire. Mm -hmm. And unhealthy perfectionists think that ideals are meant to be achieved. There's Mm -hmm. no distinction when we're in a maladaptive space between an ideal and a goal. Mm -hmm. And that's how you know that you're in an unhealthy space. Everyone is always like, oh, well, how can you tell if you're a healthy or unhealthy perfectionist? And I'm like, we're all both. You know, um, health is not this like plot of land that you discover, stick your flag in and say, I'm here. I made it. Let me send my friends postcards now. It's like Mm -hmm. life is not static. We're, we're constantly changing ourselves. We're in different seasons. The events of the world are changing. The events of our family, friends, loved ones, work, all of this stuff is in flux and so we're in flux internally and externally as it should be you know um and so it's not about like figuring out if you're healthy or not it's about understanding that you're both and how to prioritize your emotional wellness so that when you dip or dive into the spectrum of emotional illness you have some buffers around you Mm -hmm. that will help mitigate the the fall and lessen the damage because the fall's coming you know for it comes and it goes we're all just taking turns like having a hard time and then having a better time and Mm -hmm. hopefully we can all recognize that and and help each other that's kind of the Mm -hmm. point you know Mm -hmm. yeah i think the biggest thing for me that i was very uh surprised of was that perfectionism doesn't take a day off even when you are having those really slumped depressive moments and I found myself recalling back on some of my hardest depressive moments um outside of grieving for my father's passing I have had real moments of like deep uh emotions happening feelings happening and perfectionism was at times looking back in the driver's seat trying to logically navigate my way through making this go away or making this Mm -hmm. uh, emotion feel less and let my productivity feel more. And it felt like a dopamine war of sorts now that I'm looking back and really thinking like, well, who was in the driver's seat? Was it me or was it these habits that I've relied on in moments of like very deep stress or upset for myself? So I found it very interesting for me that at least – that is a tendency that I relied on to kind of give my emotional part of me a bit of a break by just really leaning into this project oriented side of me to kind of just get things done and shelf emotions. And it kind of made me wonder in learning that there were different types of perfectionists, like what led me to have this particular type of result? And I learned, or uh, I'm assuming I'm mainly a messy perfectionist. Um, and just assuming the ways in which you described the need for affection or the need for some type of support or comfort that I didn't receive kind of leaving me to trail off projects and not complete them because it mimics loss that I have Mm. somewhere inside of me that really resonated deep, but I had never thought about connecting all of those things to my output, which I did not know was perfectionism. Perfectionism has been my main character trait. And in this journey of growing, I've now noticed like, wait a minute, is it me or is it my perfectionism? Because Mm -hmm. I don't need to be on at all times. Like I am working on loving myself independent of my productivity. So like, who's, Mm -hmm. who's here to play? Is that something that most of the perfectionist types can have the ability, not the ability to, but like, are they able to decipher between this is my habit and this is who I am? You know, I think it depends on how you look at yourself and how you define yourself. Mm -hmm. And I really invite the reader to look at themselves holistically. You are a whole self and you are not the tasks you complete and you are not the, the bad habits that you have. 
Um, and you are not the people whom you make happy. You are this bigger, huge, um, elusive of like def any definition being and you're perfect. And when I say you're perfect, I am talking about the, the real core definition of perfection, which comes from this Latin root per per meaning complete and facer meaning done. And so when we talk about perfection, we're speaking to completeness, wholeness. Um, we're not talking about flawlessness, mm -hmm. which is why when we say like, oh, that, that person's a perfect stranger, you're not being like, wow, there's a, there's a flawless stranger who just walked by. You're like, <laughs> that, that's a, that person's a complete stranger to me. That's why if I asked you, Sarah, to think about someone you love and think about their laughter, you mentioned your father. I'm sorry to hear that he passed. Um, Thank you. And I don't know if you remember the sound of his laughter, but I bet mm -hmm. it was perfect, mm -hmm. you know, because it was complete. And when things have that feeling of perfection, which I have heard people describe so many times, again, thousands and thousands of times over, they are never describing the material to me. Right. They're, they're describing a sense of inner connectedness to their wholeness and mm -hmm. something bigger than themselves that they're also connected to. So that's what perfectionists are really after. That is the core driving impulse is yeah. I know I'm whole on some level and I know that I can be better connected and other people can be better connected and like we can make things better. Um, not because they are totally unacceptable the way they are, but because they're incomplete in some way. Um, and that wholeness is inside of you, mm -hmm. right? And so sometimes we're, for whatever reason, we're tired, we're confused, um, we're stressed. We confuse the two. Like, mm -hmm. as I had one client call it once, little P and big P, perfect, right? Mm -hmm. And so in, in an effort to take a shortcut to that sense of like wholeness and peace, we try to manufacture it through superficial stilted perfection, right? We want to feel really worthy of love and attention and affection. So we try to make ourselves look really beautiful mm -hmm. because if we can just make ourselves look that way, then that can somehow shortcut our sense of, of worth to that. And that's not how it works, right? <laughs> this is not how it works. And so to your point, perfectionism is about this deeper thing. It's about trying to connect to your wholeness, healthy perfectionism. And unhealthy perfectionism is about trying to avoid loss or pain that your illusion of separateness is creating in your life. So all the different types, there's five different types. They all are cry trying to avoid loss at, at some stage, right? Or a sense of disconnection. Um, and I think that that's a better way of looking at perfectionism than this like silly, in my view, way of perfectionists are people who expect things to be perfect all the time and are pissed when they're not. It's like perfectionists are actually really smart, thoughtful people. They don't wake up saying this better be a perfect day and there better be no wrinkles in my outfit and everyone better say everything I want them to say and do everything I want them to do. It's like nobody that I know thinks that way. That's not the perfectionist mindset at all. So we're, we're getting this construct totally wrong. You know, it, it was, uh, your book gave me permission to not think of uh, the aspect of perfection, perfectionism in a negative manner because it is really dulled to you in one of two ways. You're either meant to feel, feel silly or guilty about it or you're being told that it's ruining your well-being and your health and all these other things. Uh, by like the wellness communities especially, I see a lot of like, it's time to rest. It's like, well, I understand that. However, you know, I can't just – take it off and put it down. So what else, <laughs> what else can I do to help myself a little bit here? And I really enjoyed um, the, the majority of the book guys is just walking you through the many different 
gosh, there's just so much to talk about under this topic, but you're getting a ton of really palpable tools, bits of information that you're going to be able to take to help yourself on this journey. It's absolutely a beautiful book for you to take with you to your therapist or someone you're speaking with to kind of maybe guide the conversation if this is something brand new for you. I think it's just um, in knowing that so many people, in essence, it sounds like have just been given very diverse reactions to being a perfectionist. There isn't always um, the vulnerability to really admit that you feel this way or that you act this way in your life, especially if you might be on a little bit more of the intense end of the spectrum. And I wonder if you, if if someone came to you and they were struggling with their, their perfectionism and it was affecting their work life or maybe their personal life, what, what, what might there be um, something that you would say to kind of send them on the journey to either maybe feeling a bit of peace or relief or, or being able to kind of frame this for themselves in a way to where it's not as detrimental if, if it mm-hmm. is feeling like suffering? Yeah. Well, I talk about this in the book. There's, um, different perspective shifts. Um, there's a chapter dedicated to different perspective shifts. And one of them is that the difference between, um, a struggle and a challenge is connection, right? So understanding that it is not the task at hand that is creating pain for you. It's not the difficulty of the task. It's how connected you feel to another human being. And sometimes that other human being is like your deep, true self um, while you're doing the task. If you don't feel connected and you feel isolated and you feel alone and you feel that no one understands you and no one's there to guide you, it, it will be a struggle no matter what it is, even if it's something you could do in your sleep, right? If you feel seen by someone, like someone gets you. There's no solution to your problem maybe, but it doesn't even matter because you have someone with you, right? Um, Then it's still hard, you know? It's still tiring. It's still all of that stuff, but it's a challenge. Like something about it, something about connection creates courage, Whereas disconnection doesn't. Disconnection just creates a sort of contraction and connection allows for expansion. And so that's what I would, that's what I would say is like the spine of the book is that um, it, in order to heal, which again is a process, not an event, and doesn't end right there's no middle points there's no finish line um in order to heal you have to surrender something Mm. and what i mean by that is you have to let go of control and lean into power you don't have to let go of all control but you have to stop constantly trying to control the timeline of something. I should be over them by now. I should not be grieving still. I should not be like in bed still at this hour. It's like Mm. all those shoulds actually come from this idea of perfection that's very individualized for you. This is what I call emotional or cognitive perfectionism Mm. is when we want to understand things perfectly. That's cognitive perfectionism. Why did they leave me? Why did I not get the job? I can't move on until I have the facts in a row. You know, it's like sometimes there is no reason. I believed before I started practicing therapy that everything happens for a reason. And I don't believe that anymore. Oh, wow. I don't believe that anymore. And sometimes not only is there no reason there's, there's no perfect reason, but there's just no reason at all, you know? Um, and grief and perfectionism really intersect in ways that I don't think we are aware of sometimes, right. Mm -hmm. Of like closure, for example, I talk about one of the perspective shifts is closure is a fantasy, right? Like, would you think you've achieved closure in grief? And Sarah, you have to know this, right? It's like, oh, yeah. it's like 
Closure is the fantasy that we can bookend our pain and create a, here's the beginning of the story and here's the middle and here's the end. And now here I am like moving on with my life and, and living, living on. And it's like, that's not how it works either. (laughs) And just because that's not how it works doesn't mean we have to like go be in pain and be miserable and be all these things. It's just Mm -hmm. that, you know, our lives and experiences are so much more fluid than we're taught that they are. And so shifting our understanding of like success doesn't mean you, you got over it or you're done or you never think about this person or you can bump into your ex on the street and feel like cold inside, like an emotional robot, you know, like that's not, that's not what closure is. Like we, it's, a lot of this book is just like emotional literacy around some of these concepts that we, we don't have an EE emotional education in school. We have PE because we understand as a society that physical movement is important for our health. And so we prioritize it by integrating it into our public school curriculum. We don't yet have that understanding about our emotional intelligence. So how the fuck are we supposed to know? Like, how are we supposed to know any of this stuff? What's the difference between self-compassion and self-love? Because there's a huge difference. You can hate yourself and still practice self-compassion. Yeah. You know, like the, there's such um, like a blank space where our emotional vocabulary should be. Yeah. And just giving language to a lot of this stuff is like 90% of the work. It's like, oh, it's that, not that. Creating buckets is a great way to organize your mind. And, and one thing to get back to your question now that I'm saying it out loud is I create buckets of like the different kinds of help, right? And so I think of this as like support comes in every color. And when we tell people, you know, it's okay to ask for help. It's like we assume that that means emotional support. Mm -hmm. And emotional support is one kind of help, but there are lots of different kinds of help. And maybe you're not in a space where you want or even need emotional support right now. And when I say needed, I mean, because maybe you're not in a space where you can receive it. That's okay. Like I've been in spaces before as every human being, you know, has, where it's like, it doesn't matter what someone says to me or what solutions anyone offers. I am not, I am dedicated to what I'm feeling right now. (laughs) I am not moving. I don't care. I need to feel this way and just go away, you know? And it's like, Maybe in that moment, I might have needed informational support, Mm -hmm. right? So informational support is like, I'm starting a new business. I'm so stressed out or I'm starting a podcast. Let's say, I I don't know how to do this. Like, where do I start? It's like, you might not need for five hours to talk to someone about your emotions. You might need to ask someone. Sorry about that. That's okay. You might just need to ask someone like, Uh, what's the best microphone under $150? That's the information I need to feel some momentum around this. Okay, that's Mm -hmm. informational support. You might need tangible support, right? If you're a new parent, you might just need someone to come over and clean your kitchen and do your laundry. Mm -hmm. You don't need to talk about what it feels like to be a new mother or father or parent, whatever. You know, so it's like just having language around our emotional landscape is so helpful. It's like having a name for a street instead of being like the super long one, the medium long one. It's like, which one? What are you talking about? Like, yeah. we got to navigate this stuff. We got to name it, you know? And and we have about like four names for what we're feeling and thinking all the time. So I tried to put a lot of language in the book just to provide lighthouses in 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 our in our worlds, you know? Yeah, it was very um, eye-opening. It was very constructive in terms of being able to kind of immediately, it was a ton of like, oh, okay, that's why I do that. Or, oh, that's what that's called. Good to know. And like, oh, here's something I can follow up with that if I do find myself in that space again. Um, The one thing that I was, you know, it's so funny because once you've heard these things and you've read them in your book, it's almost like depending on what part of your journey you're on, you know, it's in there and it's there because you've been looking for a name or you've been looking to tie it all together in a very 
pretty bow that Mm -hmm. keeps it convenient for you to recall and actually use. And uh, I found the maladaptive and the adaptive perfectionism section really fascinating because you everyone behaves this way in some regard Mm -hmm. and you just never knew why or the reason behind it and I both found myself getting great insight onto several different versions of me along my timeline from like past and present and the ways in which I either relied on the maladaptive ways to kind of again like navigate my overwhelming emotions so that I can kind of like compartmentalize it. But could you give us a little bit of a breakdown of the maladaptive and adaptive ways that that type of thinking can like roll into the perfectionism journey? Yeah. Well, I think when you're in a maladaptive space, like I said, you think that achieving whatever you're setting out to achieve, which might not be, you know, a traditional metric of achievement, like I want a six figure salary, or I want this particular title, or I want this law degree or whatever. It might be like, I really want a partner. I want to be married. I want to have a child. I want whatever, like the pursuit of that thing, um, is accomplished in a way that's hurting you or hurting someone, hurting people around you, that's maladaptive, right? So the two questions to guide you to be able to tell whether your perfectionism is on the healthy track or the unhealthy one is how are you striving, right? Are you doing it in a way that's hurting you or hurting people around you? Um, And why are you striving? Mm -hmm. And the why is like, are you striving because you think when you're done getting this thing, then you can finally fill in the blank with something that you want. Then you can finally rest. Then you can finally feel beautiful when you weigh X amount of of pounds. Then you can finally call yourself smart. Then you can finally like fit in with this group of people that you've always felt like an outsider in. And it's, this requires some real honesty with yourself, Mm -hmm. right? Um, And only you know. So, Nobody hides their suffering better than the highly functioning person. Mm. The person who knows very well like how to seem healthy. There's a big difference between seeming healthy and being healthy. Mm -hmm. Um, And highly functioning people, that's a term, a, a sort of clinical term to mean like someone who's not in a visible crisis. So they could show up to work. Nobody's gonna call and be like, hey, you haven't paid your car payment in the last three months. What's going on? Nobody's going to see that they look disheveled. Everything on the outside is kind of like doing, you know, doing great, moving along. And you can be very um, successful on the outside to other people. And inside, you are just falling apart. Um, And whenever I hear about a famous person who has committed suicide. Um, I, I, I'm never surprised in the way that I notice a lot of other people are surprised. Like, how could it be them? Mm. Because I have had so many people come into my office who seemingly have everything, mm-hmm. you know, Everything that not only society or other people or their family of origin or whomever told them they should want, but everything they thought they wanted. Like, honestly, Mm -hmm. like, I thought this would make me happy. Like, Mm -hmm. someone who has really tried for something, worked so hard at it, gotten it or gotten close, like, has all my empathy. Because it's not like you know the whole time, this isn't going to make me happy. I just, fingers crossed, I hope it will. It's like, you really believe that. You really believe it, and um, and you can spiral really fast and furiously if you don't get a hold of those two things. How are you striving, and why are you striving? And really bring back what I talk about in the book, like prioritizing intentions over your goals and creating your own metrics of success. We need our own definitions of success because the culture's definition of success is to destroy yourself for acquisition 
and like desultory acquisition doesn't make anyone happy. Creating meaning makes people happy and it has to be the meaning that is important to you. So you have to know what your values are. So like, don't pick up the perfectionist guide to losing control. If you're looking for like a quick and breezy beach read on like <laughs> tips and hacks to life. Cause let me tell you, you're going to be so fucking disappointed. <laughs> you're going to cry on the beach a little. So like, you're going to go, <laughs> you're going to go be in a nice on the puppy beach. bed. Um, yeah. Yeah, you're going to need another Mai Tai if that's your expectation. But this is like for someone who's ready to, this is this is a book for high level thinkers who long to engage this material deeply. It is an invitation to heal. Mm -hmm. And it is not for the faint of heart. You know, it doesn't skip past the parts that are gritty. Mm -hmm. And I'm, and I'm confident that anybody who, gives their energy to it will um, get energy back from it. Yeah. I, I agree wholeheartedly there. It is, uh, I, I rented this book from the library and then three days later purchased it on Amazon. <laughs> I was like, this is something that's going to stay on my bookshelf. But I was really um, kind of piggybacking off of mentioning celebrities who seemingly have it all, your clients you spoke with that seemingly have it all. And then there is this, tragic moment, this end. And even if it hasn't gotten to that, um, level of, you know, someone deciding, Despair, they need to, yeah. yeah, but it, it was very interesting in the book when you discussed winning happiness and self-worth. And I kind of found the correlation between the three of them. It felt like a big thing for me in like the perfectionist mindset of thinking of myself. And I, kind of personally feel that I've been dealing with this trifecta for probably the last five years, not mm -hmm. always in a maladaptive way, but it certainly started out that way. How does this trifecta kind of typically present for a perfectionist and how would you recommend that they kind of go about separating like the interconnectedness or maybe I guess more the attachment, maybe a negative attachment at all of all of these things. And it's, it feels like a conversation that I've been hearing a lot more and more with celebrities going on to podcasts and kind of explaining this deep, deep sadness that they feel because they do have everything, as you stated, that they personally wanted and they feel depraved of any and all joy or worth or happiness. And it's been really mind blowing to hear that because it's definitely a new level of vulnerability. But I, I think it's important, as you said, to state that we all feel this at some point. It's not mm -hmm. just reserved for celebrities and people that have quote unquote made it. But all of that is to say, could you please <laughs> explain sure, yeah, the way in so, which they all work together? Well, so basically there's no substitute for presence and there's no substitute for self-worth. And the difference between self-esteem and self-worth is that as Dr. Brene so succinctly puts it, we think self-esteem. So self-esteem is what you think that you do well. So I, you might think that you are hot. You might think that you are really smart. You might think that you're funny to other people, but self-worth is about what you believe you deserve, right? So you might think you're hot and have good self-esteem, great self-esteem, but your self-worth is to the floor because you don't actually believe that you're worthy of love. And this gets really confusing for people because they say things like, I don't get it. How come I keep choosing to be with these like jerks? I, I'm a 10, I'm this, I'm that, I'm a, I'm a catch. And it's like, sure, you might be all of those things, but do you understand that you're worthy of feeling safe, comfortable, free, loved, adored, cherished in a relationship? Do you really believe that? Because that's what self-worth is about. And so sometimes we don't give ourselves the time to consider what we deserve. We don't, again, emotional literacy, it's not like someone pulls us aside and is like, hey, you need to understand that you deserve all of these things by virtue of the fact that you're a human being and that you don't earn them. And I talk about my sort of way of constructing self-worth in the book is that at all times, like the stained t-shirt, 
version of you that is on your seventh hour of watching some Netflix show is as worthy as like your shiniest, most accomplished self to all the love, joy, dignity, connection, and freedom that any human being is, is entitled to. You deserve those things because you were born. You need not do anything to earn them. You don't earn more love once you ma- learn how to make people laugh. You don't deserve more freedom because now you can read and write and before you couldn't. You don't earn this stuff. These things are birthrights. You do earn other things like respect, in my opinion, is earned. And it's different than dignity. Dignity says you're a human being and you deserve to be treated like a human being. Mm -hmm. You know, I was walking in Midtown. I live in New York City. And um, there was someone sitting on the street who was just sitting there, right? Um, And the person in like the third or fourth floor window, it was winter and they poured a bucket of water on this person so that they would get up and move, right? Because they didn't want them loitering outside of the building. And that is not treating someone with dignity. No. Right? It's abhorrent. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, nobody deserves that. Whether, whether you smell or not, whether it looks like you have money or not, whether, you know, nobody deserves that. Everybody deserves dignity. Not everybody necessarily deserves respect, right? So when someone DMs me a really sexually explicit message on Instagram randomly, do I need to respect that person? No, I don't. <laughs> and, the, and the insistence that I should respect all people is like, that is my tip off that you don't understand what respect is, right? Mm-hmm. Respect is about recognizing a pattern of the way someone shows up or their character or who they are that is executed consistently mm-hmm. enough and that you admire and notice, you respect it. Mm-hmm. Respect is earned. Yes. Dignity is not earned. And so many perfectionists, to your point, like feel like I'm going to be happy when we are trying to hustle for our joy We're Mm -hmm. trying to earn our permission to rest. We're trying to earn our our permission to take pleasure in our lives. We sometimes take pleasure in our lives like half an hour before I go to bed. So when I when I do the thing I want to do. Saturday mornings, I can't wait for that. It's like you're alive now. You're not gonna be alive forever. You gotta find a way to take some pleasure in your life. That doesn't mean you're gonna sink and into hedonism trust yourself you know like you don't want to be a hedonist that's why you're a perfectionist you can switch if you tried you would get so bored of hedonism you would be so bored um and so it's really about like an a, a a kind of like moving away from this pleasure in the future via four day vacation and sinking into the presence of I love the first hot sip of my tea or coffee in the morning. That is such a pleasure for me. I'm going to enjoy this. Mm -hmm. Just peppering that kind of thing all throughout your day. Not after you got to inbox zero. Not because you worked out. So I'm going to give myself a treat of this like Hershey kiss or whatever. Like diet culture Mm -hmm. is so rampant with this, what I call dog clicker language for women. Say yes. like it's like you're not allowed to feel pleasure. You have to earn it. And if you earn it, you can have some pleasure, honey, but just yeah. in this little bite. Okay? Or just on just because it's Friday night, or just because you want to be naughty. There's all this like random weird language around taking yeah. pleasure in food. Yeah. And like it's it's all it's all backwards and it's all explained in the perfectionist guide to losing control. It's like one of the reasons I wrote a book is because I could talk to you, Sarah, for hours about this. It's really, it's really um, everywhere mm-hmm. and you got to get a handle on it because again, if you don't define your own version of success and what your metrics of success are, you're just going to default to the cultures, not because you're a bad person or because you're unhealthy, but because that's what we do. We're a social mm-hmm. species, right? Mm-hmm. So, you know, other metrics of success in addition to perhaps more traditional ones might be like, how honest are you being in your friendships or your partnership? 
Um, have you laughed this week, like from your belly? You know, like, um, do you actually remember what you were doing last Tuesday or are you so tired and poorly rested that your lack of chronic, your, your chronic lack of sleep is causing memory disintegration, which is what crack, which is what lack of, of <laughs> crack, lack of chronic <laughs> sleep, um, both of them, a cause. Yeah. It's like stress <laughs> really impacts your ability to remember things. And sometimes yes. when people are like, where did the week go? It's like, slow down a second and ask mm-hmm. yourself, like, is that a, a casual, where did the week go? This is wild. But if you sit down, you can actually think about all the things you did and it, and it was a lot. Or is it like you have no literal memory of them? Yeah. That's, that's about how present you are in your life. Oh, the beauty of presence, and I guess the gift of presence to a perfectionist would seem to me, alongside the compassion factor, a little bit of vulnerability, be a really great place to start, guys. It felt very much like uh, in my past thinking that these were the natural things I wanted to do, but I for some reason needed permission from someone other than myself to give myself these things. And I think as you stated before, the book, which I will link Everything, show notes, Instagram, website, everything will be in the show notes, guys. So please just don't even hesitate. Just grab this book, especially if you find yourself, you know, someone that considers themselves very productive if you don't want to label yourself a perfectionist. But there were so many um, just chasms of overlapping like, aha, aha, aha. And until they're kind of all laid out for you very beautifully, you've put so many different instances, experiences that have allowed you to really see these very minute layers that are so, they're like the, dang it, I'm going to forget what it's called now. It's like the mycelium network of our emotional, like, uh, frameworking that we may, I, I personally was not aware of any road mapping of it whatsoever. And I recognize now that a good majority of it was, um, unable to be, experienced by me in a in like a present manner but now having the ability to kind of label certain things uh i'm just really excited for the work ahead and and what you've given me for that so my richie's listening i hope you have the same if not better interaction with this book um catherine my final question to all of my guests is how do you make your life rich Mm, through connection how predictable of an answer is that Uh, but really like um, connection to me is the center place of all healing. So if I want to be present to myself, if I want to be, um, al- if I want to feel alive in the world, that's not achieved by like waking up or having coffee or accomplishing goals to me. It's achieved by like connecting to myself, feeling what it feels like to be me, to be in my body, to be in my world, to have my history, to have my ideas, to have all my emotions, like being awake to all of that. Um, And so that looks like not numbing out as much, you know, really like you can't be connected and numb at the same time. So I've had to really change a lot of habits around alcohol and mindless eating and mindless scrolling and mindless, you know, overworking and all of that stuff. So, um, a rich life to me looks like less numbing, more connection. Beautiful. Thank you so much for sharing that. And that sounds delightful. (laughs) Uh, I want to thank you so much for coming on the show. Uh, everyone, please check the show notes. You definitely need to put this book in your cart and please check out Catherine's Instagram and her website. Your website's beautiful. I, uh, there's more information, pages and pages of very necessary reads on her website. So please check out all the links cause they're great. There are a few of them, but they are absolutely worth reading through and through. Um, thank you so much for your time. This was, uh, so exciting. I've been looking forward to this for a few weeks. So thank Thanks, you for Sarah. today. Likewise. And if it's, if you want one stop shopping, the easiest way to connect with me is on my Instagram page. There's a link to the book and my website on that page. Also additional mental health resources. And that is at Catherine Morgan Schaffler on Instagram. <laughs> Beautiful. Oh my gosh. I'm sorry. I mispronounced your name in the beginning. Schaffler. Oh, that's okay. Sorry, everyone. No worries.
All right. Thank you so much for your time. Thanks, Sarah. Take care.